All right, Petro, so we're gonna be heading down to Baja. We need help gearing up. We're gonna have people that are gonna be interested in finding both Yellowtail, Grouper, Cabrilla, Golfies. I guess while we're here by the, the lights and knives, is there anything in here that you think would be appropriate for looking for that sort of thing? I mean, you should definitely have a whole uh, light. Uh, let me open this up. So, as you can see, there's so many kinds of lights, really. And I don't have too many. So down there you definitely need a hand light, like a smaller light, like these guys, or the Tovatex are really cool. Something really compact that you can uh, carry around, have on your arm really. What are you using that light for? Hole hunting. That's what the game is down there. So what you do with the strap really, most people put it down here, but it's kind of incorrect. You want to have the strap up high so the light is completely out of the way. So when you turn, you can move it around. And you wanna have the light on the opposite hand of your gun, really. Otherwise, good luck. And also, anytime that you're gonna be hole hunting or having something loose and dangling attached to you, we always recommend to have one of these safety straps to replace the strap that's on there. You'll notice this little part right here. Let's say the light gets stuck in the hole just with some, you know, pretty easy pull. You can get yourself out of that situation, your arm comes out and uh, you can get back to safety. So definitely anytime you have something dangling off you, make sure that it's attached to one of these guys. And one typical mistake I've seen with a lot of new guys, they put a light right on their gun. That's really the wrong approach. Uh, you want to first check in the hole without the light, let your eyes get accustomed to the darkness so you can see if you can locate the species, the fish. If you can do that, you have uh, on the upper hand really, the fish cannot see you because you are, the light is behind you. So you can really line up a shot. If you turn your light on instantly, we're talking about blinding the fish so the fish will run and hide from the light. So first get in the hole, Put your head there, get accustomed to the light. If you can see, great. Try and locate the fish. If you cannot see, then you turn your light on. Perfect. How about here, we're looking at these knives and reels that you got here. How about, let's start with the knives. I mean, are they gonna need a long knife for these fish, shorter knife, what are you thinking? Definitely depends on the species. So I will definitely have two knives down there, belt knife and a leg knife. Belt knife, you have to kind of put it a bit on the side. So when you bend to go down, it doesn't poke you. On the leg knife, just because we're used to California dive, in, we have a, always a, the knife on the inside so it doesn't get hooked on lines or on the kelp over here. Over there there is no kelp, there is some sargasso in some areas. So again it's always good to have the, the knife on the inside. Some people put it on their arm but remember if you have sargasso or kelp it, it can't get caught. So just be careful with that. So I'll definitely have a small uh, knife, like a really small guy. Something easy. This knife can bring really any fish, any size fish, including big fish. Uh, many guys like having the bigger uh, knives, like the, what is this, six inch knife blade. So I, I do like carrying this. I have this knife personally. Real easy to cut through things. And if it's on your leg, you don't feel the length really. Yeah, I recently picked up the Rife knife. Where do you have that guy? Right there. Oh, that one. Yeah, I just have it in mm. black. I really like that knife. You sharp. have the old style. <laughs> Sharp knife. All right, good. Now, if we're going for, let's say the grouper, you know, your average size cabria or even like a low to mid grade golf, are you gonna be looking at a real float line? What are you looking at? So if you're gonna hunt cabrilla really between five to 25 pounds, you can go either way. Some guys are comfortable with a float line just because they don't want the fish running in the hole and breaking their mono. They do cable on their rigging really. So that's really, really important having the rigging. Many guys like float lines. I occasionally use float line as well. There is so many kinds of float lines. There is bunches, there is hybrids, there is stretch lines, there is, you name it. The problem with float lines, if a fish, a big fish runs in the hole, it will break a regular vinyl float line. That's why we use the heavy duty ones over there or even just plain ropes. The problem with the ropes is that they, they tangle easier than a float line. They are not as rigid. And now the finishes on a line, it can be like the gunnet tie, it can be a, a pigtail and a quick link. So I personally like quick links, easy to get on and off. Gannet tie is a no-brainer. If you have a gannet line, then you definitely want to have one of these. Petros, can you demonstrate that gannet knot? I forgot that some people don't know how to do this. So this is a typical uh, sheet pen knot. It's just a different way you make it. So you have your uh, the loop that you're going to put around the gun. You're going to pass it through the hole. Turn it around. And that's it. Nothing can break this line. The float line itself will break before any of this breaks. 
What sort of uh, selection of guns? Because we, you know, when we're hunting Baja, particularly when we're hunting Bola, there's gonna be different depths, different environments, different things that we're gonna be looking at the whole time. So we wanna make sure that our divers have you know, the correct arsenal to make sure that regardless of the situation their captain is putting the, them on, they're gonna have the right gear. Whenever I go to Baja personally, I treat it as if I'm going to a competition over here locally. I try to have all lengths of guns available. We have a bow meaning you can have two, three guns on the boat just to have three of the same. I like down there using a 100. I use a gun for most everything I do. Two band or even single band, even if you're shooting in a hole. I remember the holes there are big. They're not like small holes. Yeah, not like California they're holes. Case. You're looking at giant yeah. big boulders on top yeah. of each other. Yeah. I do like that length. I do use some roller guns when I go, I go down there or three band guns. Well, I wouldn't take a tuna gun for sure. I would not take no a reason. tuna gun. Yeah, no. No reason. Even if you target a big gun, Groupers, a three band shorter gun like a, up to a 120 would be more than enough for those fish. Okay, well, why don't you show us what you would recommend in the 100 range and that and all the way to that, is that, or maybe like a 90 to a 120, which ones you've got right now that you're really happy with that you think uh, if some of our members were interested in picking one up? Some new guns that we brought in was the Meandros, the Argo, and the B32. I have had several guys that bought these guns. And my opinion is that this is probably the best made uh, pipe gun right now in the market. It's got a, a pin trigger mech. What that means is not a regular sear mech and I don't think you can see it. It's actually a roller in there uh, that locks the shaft properly no matter what the position it is. The pull on this trigger is just phenomenal. The B32 and the Argo come with a, they have an upgrade, a three band muzzle and then guns are heavy enough to be able to handle this. So far uh, guys got a lot of white sivas actually and grouper with these guns. They've been telling me that they love this gun so i'm probably gonna pick one up next time i go down and what's the uh so for your what was it the 105 that you were looking at what are you yeah looking? as i told you i like the 100 so i go instantly on the 105. What, what's uh, the, the price on that 105 what's uh, the real rigged as is fully rigged uh, the b32 is around the 450 460 and the argo is around the 550 560 which is an amazing price if you consider that the reel alone is a hundred dollars plus the reel and another 45. is this a meandrus reel that you have on there yeah the threes and the fives yeah yeah, yeah. Good. And that comes with the uh, line shaft. Yeah, and completely set up bands, everything. Let me explain to you how these reels work because some people don't know. There is a lot of reels in the market. And uh, so what this reel is, is called a free spool reel and that's what most everybody uses in Europe. The idea of a reel is just it's a safety tool. So the moment you shoot something, it opens up. There is no you trying to figure out a screw and hole. So in most other reels in the market, this is called a, a drag. This is not a drag, this is called the break. So it's purely to secure the line ready to shoot. Moment you shoot, that opens up. That's it. Plain, simple, safety reel. Another thing I like to do after I clean my gun, you're gonna open the break all the way, take it all the way out. You loosen it up and then that can breathe, the inside of this can breathe and, and you can get in there and clean some of that salt out. It'll make your, your reel last a lot longer. Second style of reel since we're at Meandros and we're still sitting here. These are the drag reels, so some people like drag. This is still a free spool reel, meaning the moment you shoot, the reel will open up, but it's got a drag level. What that does, level out is complete free spool, level in, there is drag on the line. And that's for people that like fighting fish. What I tell people, if they are doing a, a deep drop, have your reel on complete free spool and have the break on. If you are in shallow, then you can have it in drag so fish can actually pull some line. Yeah, one thing about these these drag reels also is on this handle. When you get home at, at the end of the day, make sure you clean that out real good because if you don't, any salt in there will make it sticky. But as long as you give it a nice, clean, fresh water, slide it back and forth a few times, it'll work real well for you. I have this reel in different sizes on all of my guns and I really like this reel. This is probably my favorite gun I have uh, when I go down to Mexico. This is actually the gun I've been using uh, since Pathos actually made them up. It's been uh, about six, seven years now. This is what I've been using exclusively when I go to Mexico. Not for big fish, but for caprillas, yellow tails, those kind of fish. As you can see, I have a free spool reel. I personally don't like having drag reels at all, so I have a pure free spool reel. I have the regular roller band and I have the kicker band, and that's why I like the bathos guns. They do have the room for the kicker band. The rollers, as you can see, it's easy. You can take it out with an allen and clean it up instantly and get it uh, act as if it's new. Do you ever lubricate that roller? You don't need to really. Well, in the 
inside there is space in for water to move so it hydroplanes so the roller really hydroplanes as long as you just take it out and put it back in clean it that's it it's like new is there any time where you would use either the kicker or the roller band alone and or both together Can you explain uh, those scenarios okay mexico and you will find out when you go there it's really surprising the diversity uh, the fish you find so personally when i go down there i have it maxed out you could come across a 50 pound fish on a dive that you're uh, targeting a five pound fish it's just insane down there so to answer your question i have it maxed out constantly now if a fish goes in a hole and I'm going after the fish uh, depending on the size either just shoot the kicker if it's a smaller fish meaning unload everything leave the kicker on or if it's the other way around I take the kicker off and I just shoot the roller why I like this gun it's got too many stages really three stages on the bottom for power and of course you can use all the shark fins as extra stages so that's a lot of diversity in a single gun now people were on a budget and <coughs> couldn't afford to have or want to spend the money to have two or three guns do you think that this would be an all-around good versatile gun to definitely a gun between the 75s to the 105 roller um, with a kicker with a kicker it's like having seven eight guns in one yeah so it could cover a lot of kinds of diving what does that gun run that that 95 or the 105 run what, what was a fully rigged price on that guy. It's around the $500 range, if I'm not mistaken. You have those in stock, right? Not a bit low, but we always get it. Yeah. Petros, let's not forget to talk about shafts because that's going to be the biggest uh, thing. Since you're talking about shafts, if you notice here, I have a gold shaft. So this is not a traditional uh, stainless steel shaft. This is a Picasso gold, which is a carbon steel, 56 Rockwells. I've been shooting this for like two, three years now, and you can still see it goes strong. It's amazing uh, for shooting the, on the rocks. A stainless steel shaft with bend easily. As long as you know how to straighten them, you can still keep shooting because it's big species. But the carbon steel shafts will last a bit longer and Picasso is the pioneer on this. So this is a huge chapter and we're definitely gonna make a video on that one day. Long story short, most people believe the wood gun is more mass and they feel they can handle more power than a pipe gun. But you have to compare apples to apples really. You cannot compare a small pipe with a big piece of wood. You wanna do apples to apples, you get a piece of wood, you're gonna compare it with a, a monoblock gun, a carbon gun. So when you compare those two, there is really no be benefit of the wood gun versus the carbon. Actually, the carbon has a benefit. It's not a light material. It will never work, never delaminate, can be made to have same mass like the wood. And essentially, it's a big advantage of carbon over wood. But if you are going to compare a, a wood with a pipe gun, yes, 100% the wood gun will have the advantage of the more mass, meaning can handle more power. You can band it up hotter. Yeah. So as I showed you, a good example was the Meandros Argo, which is an elliptical pipe that gun can easily handle three bands and several euro style wood guns cannot handle three bands so you see a smaller pipe gun with a like a 30 percent lower price tag can handle more power on the wooden gun side i do like the new rifle marauder a really nice slick gun really well made uh, they use mahogany on the inside and uh, purple heart on the outside for hardness it's designed to handle three bands 314 millimeter bands i wish it was 316 but um, i guess they probably figured out that uh, the mass was not enough to handle 316s. They did That's the right an thing. This is an open track gun. Personally, not too fond of the enclosed track guns. Simple explanation people think uh, the fact that you have an, uh, an enclosed track gun, you can overpower it. The reality is, you overpower it to compensate for the drag you have in the track, plain and simple. So, an open track gun, if it's set properly, will shoot further than an enclosed track gun. So, this is the creme de la creme from Europe. So it's actually a wooden gun. People think it's carbon. It's wooden gun and the guy actually started by painting cars. What do you call it? Stencil painting? Yeah, and then he, he was a spear fisherman. So he just stopped his business and started making spear guns. So this is what we call an invert roller. This gun will outperform most tuna guns in the market. This was tested and there is a video we have for it. Uh, shooting 20 feet from the muzzle with a four centimeter uh, deviation to the left. I'm talking about this much deviation to the left at 28 feet so on the marauder that you were talking about yeah. before uh what sort of price range are we looking at for uh the range between uh i think about 780 to 890 the biggest one and i know fernando likes to, you know he dives baja with his uh euro. 130 euro yeah i personally i think he dives with a too long with a gun but... <laughs> 
That's Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of amazing guns, really, when it comes to wooden guns. I, here I try to maintain a, a good variety. Like, I have the Rives, which is a local company. I have Tixi, which is the largest wooden gun manufacturer in Europe. And they have phenomenal model guns, like the Hiberion, for example. Uh, this gun comes from a 115 all the way up to a 145, and it's a four-band gun. I would say the 115 that comes also in a mid-handle that would be an ideal uh, Baja gun, really, and it's under a thousand dollars. So this one's the enclosed track. Is that because of the length? No, I asked them to make it. We also have it in open track, but you know, American market, so I have to have both. And then we have the Pro Custom. Uh, I designed this gun. Actually, I used one, the 105, which is a, a good Baja gun, a three-band gun. The gun is made to handle four bands. Obviously, ideally, you only put three, but we did test it with four bands. So the biggest problem we have in Baja, water temperature. Just one day will be 80 degrees, the next day will be 55. It's just one of those weird things down there. Yeah, basically we're gonna be keeping an eye on the water temperature, checking in with Pedro from Congrejos for uh, the week prior, and we'll keep the club updated on what it's looking like before we go. So hopefully we can get a general idea. But like yeah. you said, in the, the Sea of Cortez, currents can shift, things can change, and we're just gonna have best. I always bring a variety of wetsuits. Yeah. Uh, so I think that Petros can go through those now and talk about what sort of different options you should have for yourself when you're down there. Okay, so if you are in the 80 degree weather, water temps, one Lycra, a simple Lycra will be more than enough unless you are planning to be climbing and getting yourself in holes in the rocks, then I would definitely not recommend the Lycra. Yeah, the one thing about Baja is that they don't have a noticeable therm thermocline like we have here. So you're not gonna hit that 25, 30 foot range and suddenly it's gonna be 15 degrees colder. It's pretty much equal temperature top to bottom. Yeah, personally, if you are in the 80s, I prefer to just do a double line suit. It's simple, easy, will not get destroyed, will protect you from the rocks. More than enough in an 80 degree weather. Now, if you are looking into the 80s, under 80, probably around 70 to 80. I personally like a three. Some people will, uh, low 70s will wear a five, mainly because thinking they're gonna hit the thermocline and they're gonna freeze. Reality is in Baja, you are most of the time on surface, zero to 30, 40 feet max. A three will be really good, especially the time you're going. Yeah. I would say a three millimeter would be. And on, on the charter that, that will be down, on down there, the captains will, they'll put in 20 to 30 minutes at any spot. And if it doesn't produce, you're going to be back on the boat running 26, 28 knots to the next spot. So you want to have, you know, a little bit, if it's in the low 70s, mid 70s air temperature, you're going to want that wetsuit on to keep you warm in between dives. Correct. And then of course, if it's anywhere around uh, 70 and under, definitely take your fives. And um, the surfer. <laughs> Yeah, it gets really cold, yeah. Especially on the morning, right? When it comes to fins, it's really tricky. I'm not gonna ask you to get a fancy carbon fin and go down there, definitely. I think that would be, you know, if you have good carbon fins, take them. If you don't, don't buy a carbon fin and take it down there, symbol as that. I, I do like being efficient down there. We do a lot of swimming sometimes, especially having a group of four or five guys on each boat. So I, my experience down there has been that Pedro will give you eight hours a day. Like, so his captains will give you eight hours in the water a day. If the fish are on, they're gonna give you a little bit extra. The tidal changes down there can be pretty significant. So I've had times where you were hunting a spot and you, no matter how you were kicking into the current, you were not moving. So the only way to move different spots would be on the boat. If you wanted to spend the money on carbons, that's gonna really save you a lot of energy kicking into that current, um, but it's certainly not 100% necessary. Um, you could get away with, you know, a fiberglass fin would be fine. Even plastics would be fine down there considering, depending upon how, the depth that you're wanna, gonna, gonna wanna be diving. If you're gonna wanna be chasing ca cabria and uh, barred pargo, even yellowtail in that five to, say 25 30 foot range you're going to be doing a lot of kicking around rocks big boulders so just keep that in mind when you're making a decision on the fins that you want you know just bearing in mind that they're probably going to be beaten up against some rocks if that's the type of diving you want to do i have similar to this fin, and then I also have the mantra. And an eight hour day kicking these fins, 
beat the piss out of you. But you'll love them when you get that big go the big grouper on. You'll love fighting the fish with these, but they do just kick the hell out of you um, if you have a lot of hours to put in on the water. So anybody that doesn't have a good fin like a fiberglass or a carbon, definitely take your plastic fins. Uh, what I ask people is make sure you have a backup or you have a, no, a guy that has a backup your size sometimes mexico is brutal people will lose things people will break things people thinking that the plastic fin doesn't break they're mistaken i've seen way too many plastic fins break while diving down there people that have their carpons take your carpons it is a lot of diving a lot of swimming quite often and uh, you want to be relaxed especially if we are fishing for two three days it takes a toll on you so you have a good efficient fin will make a big difference what i'm using <laughs> personally i use these guys i use the mandras mainly because it's a bigger angle uh, fin and it's uh, phenomenal on surface and uh, when I'm in Mexico I do like a lot of surface swimming that's the reason I chose that fin actually uh, any other fin really any carbon fin will do really well fiberglass as you said dive arc which is predominantly the, the brand that is out there um, some black text and some Picassos all three companies use the S glass which is a more efficient fiberglass they are heavier fins so they will take a huge toll on you a lot of muscle fatigue especially swimming uh, long days uh, but, but but as you said, <laughs> uh, fighting a fish with those fins, it's phenomenal really because you can't push a lot of water and, and bring the fish up. And that's what you're missing if you have a plastic fin. Plastic fin cannot really bring a fish up. Food pockets, there is a lot of kinds. Uh, we have the Spear Pro Genesis Pocket, which is a generic pocket that a lot of companies and they have under their name. Set my wing, probably the most efficiently designed pocket. It actually floats in the water. Some people get it I'm like, oh, this is heavy. I'm like, yeah, it floats in the water, so what does it matter? And then uh, Pathos, which is my favorite, and that's the only one that fits me, really. And uh, what I tell people, it doesn't matter what pocket you buy. If it doesn't fit you, it's like a shoe. How do you fit one? Like, if they want to come in and try one on, what's the best way for them to find okay, out? Okay, first they have to put a thick sock. A number of mistakes people make, and I've seen it many times, they come in and they put the pocket on without a sock. I mean, we are not going to wear it without a sock. And you have to wear it with the worst case scenario you have. So you're not gonna always wear a two millimeter sock. You're gonna wear occasionally a three and a four. So grab a four millimeter sock and make sure the, the feet is snug. The way you see it, you put the pocket on and then you stretch out your foot, which is your position that you are in the water. You don't stand on the, I've seen people, they stand on it. You never stand on your feet, ever. <laughs> So you, you stretch out and you make sure there's a good fit and a, a nice uh, pressure, but not uh, restricting pressure. Is there a way to just slightly off that you can modify the fit of those? Both uh, S-Wing and Bathos are uh, fully multiple. And when we say multiple, we don't mean they shrink, they expand. So I did have people that got the size bigger and they were trying to mold it to go down. I'm like, no, it doesn't go down. It only goes up. So that's why I tell people, get the pocket to be a bit snug because even if you don't mold it, it will on its own as you use it. How, if they wanted to mold it before the trip, how could they go about doing that? Uh, it's very simple. You boil water and that's the easiest way. There is another way, obviously. You boil water, put the pocket in, let it get soft and you'll feel it. Take it out, put your foot in with double sock because you will lose some of the stretch. So put a double sock on one foot, put it in, cool it, that takes the shape of your foot and then do it on the other one. Keep in mind, you need to mark the right for the right and the left for the left. Because now you've molded <laughs> it to the left and the right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another way, fast way, is using a blow dryer. You use your blow dryer carefully because if you leave it on one spot, it will melt that specific spot. You just move it around until all the rubber gets really soft and then you do the same thing. I prefer to use the water because it's more controlled. One thing I, I always like to talk about when I'm in Baja are these surfers. I find these that these guys are, man, you have to have one. Going out in the morning, oh, this is a sl slick skin also. Yeah, so it looks like we've got the, the surfer that everybody knows and loves. This one is water resistant and also wind resistant. I imagine this one is waterproof. And this is waterproof, yeah. It's a more heavy duty style of a parka. Uh, amazing for people on boats and jet skis. Yeah. And that's why I brought them here, really some jet ski guys. <laughs> yeah, for, for <laughs> Plossel and Russ, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, going out in the morning, even though the days will be warm, the mornings are going to be a little bit chilly. Plus, uh, in between dives, as you start fatiguing through the day, your body is going to be less efficient, less efficient at warming itself back up. So, throwing this back on really will make you more comfortable throughout the day. And the whole key to going through a three-day dive trip where you're sp uh, spearfishing for three days is to make sure that your body is as comfortable as possible. So you can minimize that fatigue. So I definitely have a 
surfer that I bring along to keep me warm. Definitely, you want to have a, a decent small equipment bag on the boat over there, especially having four or five guys on the boat is going to be a mess. So four, four guys for boat, yeah. plus a captain yep. and a deckhand, that's six. Yep. Don't go down there thinking with a sport tube, thinking you're going to put your sport tube on the boat or just throw your stuff on the boat. No, you need to be organized down there. So you have to, each person has to have their bag with their essential scene, a bag up, as I said before, you know, a pair of fins, a mask, snorkel bag up, definitely. And just be organized. Uh, organization is key down there. You don't waste time, you don't lose stuff, you don't have accidents. So definitely have a, a, a bag, 100%. Yeah, when you're talking about backups, that brings up a really good point. I mean, I think that it, especially in the remote places of Baja, like we're going two is one, one is none. There are no dive shops down there. There is no way to repair your, your gear. Bring a backup. I mean, you should just have an extra dive knife bare minimum because somebody's going to break some gear and you don't want that to be you and have it ruin the rest of your trip and, and you're sunbathing for a few days and a lot of spears you are taking two guns you better have at least six spears six. yeah uh, i six, bring three six. per gun yeah uh, i would say three per gun i've seen it so many times first day out lose two spears yep First and it's either when he says lose these fish when you shoot the grouper especially whether it's a gulf or a cabrilla the very first thing they're going to do is run to the rocks they're going to try to hold themselves in, up in the rocks and if you can't turn their head before they get to the rocks you've now got a battle on your hand and they're going to pull that shaft down as deep into the rocks as they can they're going to bend it they're going to break your mono they're going to everything's going to be wedged down in there so i keep a minimum of three shafts i usually bring two or three guns i bring two on the boat um and a minimum of three shafts for each some of them i have four shafts uh because because you're probably gonna lose at least one of the rocks. You're almost guaranteed gonna bend one at least. So you just make sure that you pick up extra shafts so you can keep diving. Yeah, definitely. And crimping kit and uh, mono, that's a plus. I assume at least one guy on the boat should have a crimping kit. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, ke I keep one. I have a, a pouch on, on my dive bag that I bring on. I have a pouch out front that holds like a rife plastic kit with all my crimpers, crimps, extra uh, tuna clips, things like that. So yeah. Definitely a lot of rigging stuff. Definitely have a bug up belt, at least one per boat, at least. Uh, belt I've break. seen belts break, and uh, belt breaks, that's it, done. Yeah, it's ill-advised to try to stuff your wetsuit with rocks. That's a bad idea. Yeah, so definitely at least one guy per boat should have a, a bug up belt. I always take uh, an extra belt in my bag, really. You have the weights. If you break your belt, you're gonna still have your weights unless it drops at 200 feet. Floats can be good for two reasons. The first reason, obviously, is for their intended purpose of fighting a fish but when you've got four people out on the water and you've got a boat trying to keep track of all of you and you've got your fancy dancy camouflage on it is going to be a little bit more difficult for the boat captain to see you if you and your dive buddy there's going to be two groups of two so if you and your dive buddy get go this way and the other dive group goes this way the captain has to keep track of everybody so by having a float with you even if it's not attached to your gun even if you have it attached to a weight and another rope that you keep in your general vicinity is going to help that boat captain keep you guys going so Petros, maybe you can go through a few of the options for... Yeah, I mean, when it comes to Baja, you don't really need a tuna float per se. You just need a simple uh, marker float. And you can see over here, there is too many really to choose from. You can simply go with a $40 float and be more than enough. I've seen guys take their blue water floats thinking they're gonna shoot uh, this monster yellow tail that will take everything down. It's not a bad idea to have like a 15 PSI or a 20 PSI float. It, I've seen it before, big yellow tail but in general you're targeting yellow tails up to maybe 30 pounds so you, you really don't need, do not need a gunnet float out there uh, it's a good marker if you have it take it if, that, if that's the only float you have why buy another one yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely have to have extra rubber for your guns. It's not only the shafts that bend, but you also break the bands. Some people get fresh bands thinking it's all good, but you just don't know what's gonna happen. You might need a band, another guy might need a band, and before you know it, if you know how to tie bands, get in rubber. If you don't, just get at least one spare band per gun. So definitely have a good pair of gloves. You know how it is down there. And be careful when you grab a group pair, their gills are brutal. Spikes uh, on them. Once you Sharp. put your hand in, doesn't come out. So do not grab them from the gills, really. You have to grab them from the gear plate or one nice trick that we do in Europe, you actually grab them from the eyes. The moment you put your hands in their eyes, especially when the fish fight too, they actually mobilize themselves. Yeah. The moment you grab their eyes, they stop. 
Yeah, on the underside, if you're looking head on at the fish, the front side of their actual gills, the curve of their gills are gonna, or where they have their little breathing fingers on, the back side of it have these crazy like sharp spikes. It's so like Petro said, if you try to grab underneath those gills, like the, the physical gills themselves, you're gonna get hooked up on those gills. If you just grab the plate itself, you're not gonna get messed up at all. You can control them by the plate. Don't reach underneath the gills. Make sure you have, you know, some- A good set of gloves, uh, something that Dyneema glove, uh, would be good even uh, you know it's summer so symbol glove dynamic glove would be fine and keep in mind you're going to be doing a lot of rock hunting so you're going to be crawling over rocks there's a lot of espeto diving which uh, for those of you who don't know dive down to the bottom lay on the bottom nice and still relaxed maybe clank some rocks together to make some noise maybe strum your bands a little bit but you're going to be on the rocks so the gloves and booties wetsuit is going to protect you from getting beat up on those since you brought that up make sure you have extra weights over here where used to be kind of neutral at 20 feet. Down there, you need to be neutral uh, at a smaller depth. So you're you not need to be a bit heavier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the, the safe method that is taught in FII is to set your buoyancy at 33 feet. But a lot of you are going to be maximum diving in that 30, 40 foot range. You're going to be really buoyant. So the way that you do there is you're going to set yourself neutral at about half the depth that you're planning to be diving at. So if you're going 30, so 40 feet, you're going to be setting yourself neutral at 20 ish feet, which means you need more weight. And if you don't have one or two of these, definitely definitely get. Uh, this is the easiest way to adjust yourself from a smaller depth to a bigger depth on the boat, on the go, take it off, put it back on, go to a shallow spot, put it on, go to a deeper spot, take it off. Simple as that. All right, so now you've been on the water all day. You've got some nice fish at Congrejos. The captain, your boat captain, Pedro, their whole crew is actually going to do the majority of the filleting for you. It's part of the service that they offer. If you'd like, you could bring a fillet knife of your own. I really, really like the Banshee blade that Pedro sells here. Super Super sharp, nice, he sells a stiff one and a flexible one. I use the stiff one, I fillet 90% of my fish with it, it's great. You're also gonna wanna bring some sort of vacuum sealer with you, with your own vacuum sealer bags. Pedro does not have any of that down in Mexico, but he will have places for you to plug in and, and vacuum seal your fish. Bring a lot of paper towels, cause you're gonna want to dry all of your fish. You don't wanna ever, ever wanna vacuum seal a wet fish. You wanna pat that nice and dry, stick it in the bag and vacuum seal it. He's gonna have one freezer, like a stand up, uh, front door freezer for each boat that's going to be going so we have six boats he's going to have six full-size freezers there so at the end of the day he's going to fillet you're going to vacuum seal your own fish and we're going to throw it in the freezer and by morning that stuff is going to be hard as a rock now getting the fish home you're going to want to have a nice cooler to pack all that stuff in to get home i usually bring a yeti 110 and then also my brother has an arctic 130 and we'll bring those down we'll pack those full there is a tecate in, in town where they sell ice so in case you don't fill it all the way full with fish as much of the air in the cooler as possible with ice pack it tight close it and unless a federale or someone asks you to open it you will not open it until you get home and it should be able to last the 10 or 11 hour drive to get home depending upon the border big chapter masks will just cover a tiny bit so number one thing for uh free dive spear fishing masks they cannot have a clear skirt symbol as that they can have a color skirt but not clear reason is uh, where most of the time on the surface the glare from the sun just blinds you you cannot see the bottom so the mask has to have a solid color skirt it could be pink it could be white it could be red it could be black doesn't matter and also when you try on a mask try to find the best fitting lowest volume mask possible i cannot stress that enough and i tell people just use this whole area and start trying them on anything that fits you put it on the can side you, can you teach us how proper to way mask? okay yeah I found the mask maybe, that fits maybe me, find actually. one that doesn't fit also so we could show yes it. definitely so you put it on Take a small breath and it should stick. Now it won't stick because I'm <laughs> pointing out. If you are like him with a beard, it's simple, you use Vaseline, really. You just put some Vaseline here and it will have a seal. Remember, you have a snorkel in your mouth, so you just do this and that's enough to mimic the snorkel. If the mask fits you like this, you're good. A mask that doesn't fit, you will know because you're, let's see if which one doesn't fit me. I mean, none of them fits me. <laughs> so you put the mask on, <sighs> and you can clearly breathe, it doesn't fit. Yeah, you have to imagine that all that air that's moving in and out on the surface yeah. is gonna be water that's moving yeah. in and out underwater. So once you find the masks that fit you, see which one is the lowest volume. And then if you are not a deep diver, don't even care about the low volume. Care about uh, your view, your field of view. So stand on one spot, 
and mat with one mask, left, right, top and bottom, and then put on the second mask that you are trying to decide between and mark the area again. Get the one that has the highest field of view. Simple as that. Yeah, it has to do with the structure of your eye sockets and all that, the, the, the different configurations that will make it better. Um, and then for those of you that are deep divers, the low volume is most important because you're gonna have to, as you get deeper and deeper, just like you have to equalize the air that's in your mask, you have to do that by actually releasing some air from your lungs through your nose into the mask so it doesn't feel like it's pulling your eyeballs out of your head. So by having a low amount of volume in the mask, you have to equalize less of that. So, and let's cover the snorkels too. There is three kinds of snorkels. I know there is more now, but three basic kinds. There is the what they call the dry snorkel. There is what they call the semi-dry snorkel and a simple J snorkel. Dry snorkels we don't have here because they are really dangerous for free diving. The dry snorkel is a snorkel that really has a ball here or something else that literally locks it. So when you go down, it locks the air in. And those are really dangerous for us. Uh, a lot of CO2 built up. Some other issues I've heard of people thinking that it's locked and they suck water in. Yeah, my daughter, <laughs> I took her snorkeling one day and she had one of the dry snorkels. And even if they're not perfectly clean, they start malfunctioning a little bit with that ball will close and so she'd just be on the top of the water and try to take a breath in and be, you know, and can't, and yeah. then for any new diver, it's just a really bad. So yeah, just avoid dry snorkels. If you ever bought one, get rid of it really. Semi-dry snorkel is symbol. They have a valve at the bottom to release the, the water in there. Um, many people find it real easy to breathe with these snorkels, mainly because you don't have to push there all the, the water all the way up. And on the top, all it has is a protection to for waves, really. It's so you don't have any splashing in the snorkel. Yeah, and keep in mind also that, that, you know, the water draining out the bottom also is, is a feature more for people who are going to be snorkeling because as as we know when we're free diving you're taking the snorkel out of your mouth anyways so when you get to the top of the water that's just going to drain out naturally you give it a, a like an, a, J, a J snorkel give it a quick shake and now your snorkel's dry yeah one thing i've seen many people do actually uh, they use the symbol J snorkel and they think oh i keep too hard to blowing the the water out you really never have to do that mm -hmm. You remove the snorkel before you descend. When you ascend, you come to the surface, your head is out of the water, you do this, and then you put it in. Yeah. You don't have to put the snorkel in your mouth and keep while you're going up. You're, you're wasting energy for no reason. The main objective is to go to the surface and take a deep breath, that's it. A really rule, like a rule that you need to stick to is anytime you're underwater, there's no snorkel in your mouth ever. It's compromising your airway. It's giving yourself an open mouth where water could get in and get into your lungs. Just never, ever, ever, ever have a snorkel in your mouth underwater.